we see the, um, where's the pointer? Oh, here. All right. Okay, um, I'm Wang Yin Shou from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And for those, um, th so this is Mount Rainier, Lake Union, and this is Hutch. That's where I work. For people who do not know me, our lab has used um, engineered communities because they're very um, well controlled and the mathematical models to understand, for example, the evolution of cooperation and cheating. For example, we showed that adaptation to a new environment can allow cooperators to purge cheaters stochastically. Moreover, defectors or cheaters can paradoxically create conditions that rescue cooperation from cheaters. We also studied um, spatial organization, that is how um, interacting cells, cells that affect each other's fitness, organize themselves uh, spatially. For example, we showed that strong interpopulation cooperation between green and red would cause mixing of um, these two populations. We further showed that spatial self-organization favors cooperation over cheating. In this case, for example, the isolation of the blue cheaters away from the two um, cooperating populations. But today, I want to, um, I want to um, talk about something that's completely new, it's not published. And because I'm giving the last talk of the first day, and I think some of us are probably still jet lagged, so I, want to, uh, so I have decided to change the style of my talk to a little bit conversational. Um, that is no slide for a while. And I want you to interrupt me with questions, because I like that far better. Okay, so I want to open this, the formal part of my talk by posing a question. So suppose I have a community of six, say, bacteria species, and the community does something interesting. For example, it converts cellulose, an agricultural waste, to a useful product, such as an anti-cancer drug. But the activity is very low, and I want you to help me to improve the activity of this community. What would you do? Excuse me, what did you say? What? Rise the temperature, well, but you don't, we, that's, you can try, ran, I mean, of course one can try random things to see. I mean, somewhat aren't targeted, they're trying, right? But the combination is, is enormous. So one might want to ask, what? Keep very good point. So I will, that's a very good point. I'll come back to that. So the first question one might, the first step one might want to do is to figure out whether a single species has that activity. Because if a single species can do it, then we don't need to worry about five other species. And we don't need to worry about looting that species just in case that species actually grows slower than five other species. We don't need to worry about losing it when we do serial passage. So we'll go back to lab, isolate the six species, and test one by one. And if we find that no single species has that activity, and that activity I will define as community function. So that is. So community function is a biochemical activity that is possessed by a community, but not by any member species alone. So now suppose that we find that no single species can do it, so it's community function. So we still want to see what is the minimal subset of communities that can do that, sort of like what Pete um, said. So you can also do standard dropout experiment, right? You, drop, you throw out species one, you throw out species two, and so on and so forth. And so in the end of the day, you might realize you only need two species to have this function. Then what, what do you do? Excuse me? Ecosystem, Ecosystem what? Ecosystem. Network selection, very good, very good. Um, so one possibility, so I will come back to that point. So one possibility is to try to figure out why you need two species to have this activity. That is how species A affects species B and or how species B affects species A. But this is no trivial task, because we know for species that are relatively uncharacterized, each species can release tens, if not hundreds, of compounds. And many of these compounds can affect the other species in diverse manners. And so suppose you actually, you in fact, go to the laboratory and figure that out. You end up with a haystack of interactions. And by interactions, I mean instances where an individual alters the physiology of another individual. So you have this huge list of interactions. But still, you will have to figure out from this haystack, 
the needle interactions, right? Interactions that are actually critical for community function. And then I'll give you a hint of how to genetically manipulate species or alter abiotic environment such that in the end you can modify community function. Alternatively, as that gentleman suggested, you might be able to perform artificial selection experiment. That is, you grow up many copies of that community, allow cells to grow up, allow them to accumulate mutations. And then you will select among this population of communities, those communities with high activity, and then only allow these to reproduce. So how would you reproduce a community, right? Community is not a cell. So you could, for example, split a community into sub, you know, in, into sub or baby or newborn communities and allow them to grow and then repeat the cycles again and again. Conventional wisdom says you get what you select for, but is that true? I want to show you that it is often not true, but if you're smart about how to do that experiment, you could in fact probably get that to work for you. So going back, uh, so, but before we dive into details, I want, um, I want to actually take one step back and, uh, and uh, um, introduce first selection of individual cells. And trying to think about how selection on cell level different from community level, right? So I want to really ask the folks on cells and the communities. What's the difference? So by cells, I hear actually in the talk, I will only focus on asexual microbes. So imagine I have a population of cells. They all express JFP, right? And suppose I want the fastest growing cells. What would I do? I would grow up the culture, take out the sample, and subcult subculture them and inoculate them into fresh medium. I will propagate, that is, propagate this, um, this population again and again. And uh, um, by definition, almost, right, the, the fastest growing cells will take over. And this is what I call natural selection, right? The survival of the fastest growers. Now imagine that actually what you want are the brightest cells. Because expression of GFP usually inflicts a fitness cost. So those cells, the bright cells, tend to be slow growing. So how would you select them? Obviously, you cannot use this anymore, right? So instead, you would use artificial selection. So what would we do that you would grow populations of cells up? You will select the, select the brightest cells using, for example, flow solder. And then only allow those cells to grow. And that's artificial selection. In order for selection to work, you need three key elements. First is variation. And you need a selection, and you need heredity. So variation, mutations can create variations in genotypes and thus phenotypes. Selection in artificial selection experiment is done artificially by flow sorter. And heredity is also satisfied in this kind of experiment because bright cells tend to give birth to bright cells saving for those rare events where mutations actually break this uh, heredity. So this kind of artificial selection experiments on cells have been, been done numerous times with great success. So how might that work for communities of cells from different species? So community selection has been done, but not many times, only a few times. And I want to present you with example, uh, a, a typical example. So in this example, for example, um, Researchers are interested in isolating communities that will degrade uh, industrial pollutant, uh, shown here as, uh, um, as brown color. So what they did is they went to a pond, and they isolated a bunch of microbes and mixed it up and inoculated it into 15 tubes. So these, they, so these I will call uh, newborn communities, right? Even though we use newborns to usually mean individuals, but here I mean communities. And then after four days of maturation time, the cells will grow up and they will start degrading industrial pollutant. So then I will call the last stage uh, adult communities. So bear in mind that the maturation period of time was um, somewhat arbitrarily selected. So when I say adulthood, I don't exactly mean some special physiological state such as stationary phase. So among the 15 adult communities, those experimentalists um, picked, um, picked uh, three top performing communities with you know, the lightest color and mix them, and then um, allow these to reproduce by splitting them back into 15 newborn communities. And this I 
called selection experiment. Of course, they had a control. They randomly picked three adult communities and then reproduced again by splitting. So this is the control. So out of four control experiments, the pollutant degra uh, degrading activity increased in two and decreased in two. In all the four selection experiments, the pollutant degradation activity increased in three and it decreased in one. So, it, um, so of course, the number is too small to tell, right? This experiment is very interesting. But even if it had worked, we would not know the, we would not know the mechanisms. First, we do not know whether pollutant degradation is a community function or whether it can be, um, it can be done just by a single species. Second, uh, which, I, uh, which uh, second is actually quite key point, which is that we, they would not know, we would not know whether selection acted on species or genotypes of species. And I would argue that this distinction is, is important because if selection had worked on species like the enrichment culture kind of experiments, then you would expect probably the community function would improve very fast initially as the right number of the right types of species are concentrated and the species that are not good for the activity uh, function is, um, is discarded. But then because there's no influx, continuous influx of species, we would expect that community function would level off um, also very, very quickly. In contrast, if a selection worked on genotypes, we would imagine that mutations would create new genotypes and that might allow community function to continuously improve. And this kind of studies would not reveal that. And the third point, which is also a very critical point, is that we do not know whether community level selection is in fact needed, right? Because you can imagine the microbes might use the pollutant as carbon source. So if they grow faster, they will degrade the pollutant faster. And in that, in that sense, you don't actually need community selection. You just natural selection would already um, generate exactly the same result. So we want to understand this process better. And I remember um, going to an uh, evolutionary biology meeting asking three um, well-respected evolutionary biologists. Right? Suppose I were to do an experiment like this, I would need to know many details. For example, I would want to know how many communities I have to start with, I have to select from. So ask them that question. So the three answers are the following. The first answer was, that is a great question. The second answer was tens of communities, just like this one. And the third answer was millions of communities, because the more the better. Because very little is known about how to do this type of experiments. So we were sort of forced into doing some theory first. You know, actually our lab is mainly experimental lab. So we want to consider this um, actually from a theoretical point of view, hoping that what we learned in theory would help us, uh, would help us design better or smarter experiments. By we, I mean uh, Li Xie, a very talented postdoc in my lab. And of course myself is also, um, is also involved. So the uh, system we are interested in, um, oh, first of all, we have no experimental data yet, right? So this is just uh, all the things I'll show you are um, a computational results. So the system uh, we are studying is a, a two species community comprising helper H and the manufacturer M. The manufacturer makes a product, which I call P. The helper, but not the manufacturer, can digest cellulose on agricultural waste. And as the helper grows on cellulose, it releases byproducts, such as acetate or whatsoever. Right? And this byproduct happens to be the sole carbon source for manufacture. And the manufacturer um, would devote a fraction of the cellular resource to make product. And FP here is the most important parameter here. F means the fraction of manufacturer growth. And P is subscript um, for standing for the product P. And the remaining one minus FP is then used for manufacturer to grow. So these two species are enclosed in an artificial boundary, community boundary, such as a microtidal well. And in addition, the two species would compete for shared resources, such as, a, 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 such as nitrogen. Uh, so for, for, for this community, right, so we know that the helper would just grow, right, because it has, it has cellulose waste, it has shared resources, it would just grow. The question is that whether two species can coexist. So manufacturer initially cannot grow, right, because they have to wait for the byproduct. But if when the byproduct has accumulated to a high enough level, manufacturer actually catches up in a sense that it actually grows faster than helper, 
then there's a chance that two species would coexist. And in fact, these, um, these kind of, um, this kind of communities have been engineered. And then when these two species grow, they will deplete the resource, and the growth will cease, and the products will not be made, uh, will cease to be made at the end. And these, um, in fact, in this kind of communities, the species composition can be stable in the sense that if you start the two species at different ratios, the ratios will converge to a steady state level. So now with the comforting thought that we have a community uh, which has, as I said, has been demonstrated in the, uh, in the laboratory, we have two species community that can stably coexist. Then we can define community function. So here I define community function as following. We have a newborn community with helper manufacturer, and then we give it cellulose in excess always. And then we give it a fixed amount of resource. And after maturation time T, the cells will grow, and they will consume the resource and make product shown here uh, as magenta. So we define community function PT as a total amount of product P at the maturation time T. Of course, there's a lot of thinking going into the choice of maturation time T. Right, as experimentalists, I don't want the maturation time T to be too short, right? Because if it's too short, um, it's a waste of this resource. And also, uh, and also just a it's a very little chance for mutations to accumulate. At the same time, we also don't want the maturation time to be too long. Because if it's too long, the cells will hit stationary phase, and it will get into very complex physiological, physiological changes, as Professor Huang just talked about. So we chose the maturation time T such that the majority, but not all, resource has been consumed. Just from, because these are the um, considerations as, ex, as I, as experimentalist, would, would entertain. And now, um, and now what, what affects community function? Of course, initial conditions, right? The initial numbers of helpers and manufacturers in the community, uh, the resource, uh, and also there are parameters, and by parameters for biology audience, they're just, um, they're just phenotypes of cells that we can actually measure in the laboratory. For example, the growth phenotype of manufacturer, right, includes the, max, the maximum growth rate of manufacturer, uh, of helper, sorry, of helper, and helper's affinity for, um, for resource. Here we don't consider cellulose because it's, in, because it's present in excess. And for manufacturer, it's maximal growth rate of manufacturer, manufacturer's affinity for the byproduct and for the shared resource. And then, of course, the manufacturer's uh, FP, and that's a very critical parameter because that is involved both in growth and in the um, production of the product. The other parameters we consider not changing, uh, evolutionary, not capable of changing dramatically. For example, the release rate of byproduct as a function of growth rate and also the conversion factor that converts resource to cells. So then we have these six changing parameters, right? So it turns out that in our system, improving cell growth, that is you improve the maximum growth rate, you improve the affinity of cells for resources, that actually improves community function in single or in combinations. This doesn't have to be true in general, but it happens to be in our case, it is true. And the parameter ranges we chose for this model is based on yeast, uh, or based on the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So this turns out to be very convenient because that means that we can fix the other five parameters to the biological maximum and only consider one parameter change, FP. So now if we fix the five parameters and ask, what FP would give you the maximum community function? We get this, right? So maximal community function is achieved at the intermediate level of FP. And that's very intuitively, um, it's very intuitive because if FP is zero, right? So the no product is made, they devote nothing to making product. But if FP is one, they devote all its resource, all the manufacturer devotes all the resource to make product, it won't grow. Then it would be outcompeted by helper. Um, so then how might we experimentally realize that, um, that, that optimal state? Right. A bioengineer would say, well, why don't we pre-optimize the helper and the manufacturer individually in the sense that we'll make helper grow as fast as it can so that it makes a lot of byproducts. We can also make the manufacturer you know, make a lot of products. So let's try that. Let's go back to the previous slide, because as, as I have just shown you, that for helper, um, if you increase the cell growth, right, you actually improve community function. 
So we can just simply do a natural selection experiment on, uh, on, on helper. That is, we just grow it and do serial passaging it in the presence of the shared resource. But for manufacturer, it's a lot more tricky, right? Because we cannot do natural selection, because natural selection would favor um, zero FP, non-producers. So one might think, okay, why don't we do artificial selection or manufacture based on its ability to make this product? So experimentally, you can do this, right? And there's a larger literature on group selection. That is, you select on groups of, um, groups of cells of the same species. There's a large literature, so I do not have time to cover, cover it. Suffice to say, uh, from literature, it seems like the best way of doing such experiment is that you put a single M cell, one each, into microtiter wells, right? And you give it resource and give it a byproduct. And you let it grow for um, mature uh, maturation time T. And look at which well has the highest amount of product. And you only allow those manufacturers to, uh, to, to reproduce. Sure. Oh, absolutely, I agree with you, yes. Okay. In, yes, but in our, in our parameter range, this happens to be the case. Okay. It happens to be, that's true, it's a, that's a very good point. It doesn't have to be. And um, so uh, in this case, so we, we could, but then the question is how much byproduct would you add to a well, right? So you could, ideally you want the, the byproduct the dynamics to be like what's happening in the community, initially low, and as helper goes up, it goes up. But it's very hard to do experimentally. So for simplicity, we'll just add excess amount of byproduct. So it turns out for this kind of um, group level selection, um, artificial selection OM, we get that the optimal, optimal FP also is at, of course at the intermediate level for exactly the same reason, right? For if you have zero FP, the manufacturer is not making any product. You don't have zero, any product. But if FP equals one, the single cell is not dividing and might even die. So you have this low, um, low product. But we notice that FP optimal for monoculture is below that's optimal for community. And that actually is not surprising in the sense that in monoculture selection experiment, we're giving it excess byproduct, which is in contrast in community where the byproduct is produced, is provided by, um, provided by the helper. So now, we, um, so now it comes to the, ma the first major conclusion of this talk, which is that you could pre-optimize each individual um, species, but, um, but the monoculture optimal may not equal to community optimal. So now the question becomes this, right? So if we, ha we, this is, if we start here, right, the monoculture optimized state, then we know that natural selection would pull this, will decrease FP to zero. So the question is, that how might we do community level selection such that right, we, will push, we will push FP up against natural selection to that which is optimal for community function. So now I will go through, um, a, go through the selection process. So we start with newborn communities. Of course we can start with hundreds or millions. The more communities you have, the more variations you can select from. But also, the but problem is that the experiment becomes much more expensive. And here we have, we, we choose 100 communities, and each community has about 100 helper plus manufacturer. And we choose number 100 cells so that we don't accidentally lose one species. And the ratio is about one to one, but the ratio doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter which ratio you start from. They converge to the steady state ratio, which is around one to one. And then we, um, we give it excess cellulose and a fixed amount of resource. And we wait for maturation time T until, they, um, until at the end of that. And so we, as I told, I told you before, the maturation time T is, um, is such that the resource, the majority of the resource is used, but not all of it is used. And we put enough resource such that during this process, the total population will increase by about 100 fold. And here, during the maturation, mutations will occur. And I said, because we have fixed the other five parameters to the um, biological uh, mac uh, maximum. So the mutations can only happen in FP, the fraction of manufacturer growth devoted to making product. So we, um, the, so we pick the mutation rate, so mutations will occur with a probability determined by mutation rate. And the mutation rate is the highest uh, that has been observed among the mutators. So it's still relevant, it's still re you know, realistic. We do this to speed up our computation. But we have also tried it with a lower mutation rate and the same conclusion holds. Now the phenotype, how would the, the mutation change the phenotype? 
We based our parameter choice on a recent study on extensive mutagenesis on GFP. So what they found is that the, the vast majority of mutations are neutral. And a small fraction of mutations would make a non-mutants, that is, make FP to zero. And then uh, the rest of mutations will make small changes, right, plus or minus a few percent of the FP. So then we can, so out of these, um, out of this um, communities with highest function, we will allow that to reproduce in the sense that we will split it into newborn communities of about, on average, about 100 total cells. And if there's not enough communities, we'll go to the second highest performer and continue this process until we recover a total of 100 communities with about each with each with about 100 total cells. And this process, um, and this re process uh, repeats, this cycle repeats. So let's consider the three key elements here, right? So selection here is very similar to selection on individual cells. It's artificial selection. We pick, we pick whichever community that is the highest uh, function. So variation here, mutations will introduce variations among individuals and thus variations among communities. But there are additional sources of variations. During reproduction, each newborn community would sample a, sub a subset of the genotypes of the parent adult community. As a result, these newborn communities would look different from each other. That's variation. Moreover, even though we are targeting on average 100 total cells, some communities, some newborn communities would happen to have 80 cells and some would happen to have 130 cells. And this, this would make all these newborn communities look different from each other and also from the newborn of the last cycle. And furthermore, there's another element that might, that might compromise heredity. That is during maturation, uh, the genotype frequency can change rather rapidly, making those ones look different from the newborn of the last cycle. And that's my definition of heredity, the similarity of newborns from one cycle to the next. So the question is that, will heredity be strong enough for community level selection to work? I'll show you some results. So first is random, right? Random selection, you randomly, we randomly pick adult communities to reproduce. And not surprisingly, the community function declined very rapidly to zero. It's because, it's because um, making product has a fitness cost. And in the absence of community selection, the non-producers are favored. Now, if we apply community selection, we see this, right? So the three blue colors are three independent experiments. We see the community functions fluctuate around the starting point marked here by the magenta cross. It's better than the control because it doesn't go to zero. But these are nowhere close even to a um, theoretical optimal. Why is that? Why doesn't it work? So we looked, um, we looked to see uh, in, among one in, within one selection cycle, how does community function correlate with various properties of newborn communities? The reason we look at the newborn communities is because, um, because the mutations occur rarely, and also the frequency, because it's a small change in frequency, a uh, small change in fitness, in fitness in FP and fitness. So they actually mutants, even if they arise during maturation, they don't arise, they don't, the frequency does not increase that rapidly. And thus the community function at adulthood is almost completely determined by the newborn by the newborn um, state. So first we look whether that, that's you know, correlated with FP, because that's the thing we want to select on. We see very little correlation, right? So these two dots are the two newborn communities that when, uh, when reach adulthood being selected, because these two dots have the highest, highest community function. But if you, lo you look at the uh, average FP, average among manufacturers, it's actually below average. Now, if we look at, if we correlate, we, if we see that um, we um, we see that community function instead is highly correlated with the total population size of newborn, because these two um, communities, it's identical to these two, happen to have a higher number of total cells in the newborn state, and these also have a higher fraction of helpers. So, why would um, community? Why would this correlation exist? If we look at the dynamics, it becomes um, clear. Remember I told you that we chose maturation time T such that the majority but not all resource had been depleted to avoid a stationary phase. So during this maturation time, the cells will grow and the product will be made. And this is for average community. 
But by chance, some newborn communities could start with higher number of um, total um, population, uh, total cells. And these ones will be able to deplete the resource more thoroughly and make more products. Even though these, the lucky community has exactly the same FP as the average community. And for helpers, the fraction helpers, it's exactly the same uh, reason. Because if you happen to sample more helpers, the manufacturers will um, experience less lag. And then they will be able to quickly grow, uh, more quickly grow, and deplete resource more thoroughly and make more product. So a prediction from this kind of reasoning is that if we fix the number of helpers and the manufacturers in each newborn community, this would work. The community selection would work. And this, in fact, can be done experimentally by sorting the helpers and the manufacturers into each newborn community. And when we try that, when we fix the number of helpers and the manufacturers in newborns, we indeed see that the, the community selection now um, works, at least in theory. A second possibility is that, going back to this, is that we could, for example, extend, extend, right, extend the maturation time just bit by little bit, such that those average communities and unlucky communities would have time to catch up to those lucky communities shown um, in, uh, in, in dashed line. And this, this would allow all these communities with the same FP to have exactly the same function. And we tried that. We extended the maturation time 20% longer, and that also allowed the community selection to work uh, effectively. Although a cautionary note is that then we will need to deal with heterogeneity introduced by different, different duration, different length of duration in stationary phase, which might also create experimental com um, complications. So to summarize my talk, I've, to I've shown you two points. First, that we might want to pre-optimize um, member species before embarking on community function because that sometimes can help. Although a monoculture optimal may not equal to community optimal. And the second, we see that large non-heritable variations can arise uh, during reproduction. For example, when newborns form, the numbers of helpers and manufacturers can dramatically influence community function and thus making the selection of FP much harder. That is, you have much higher noise compared to signal. That is, you have much higher level of non-heritable variations compared to heritable variations, which, are mediated, which is mediated by FP. And this kind of large non-heritable variations should be minimized for community function to, um, for, for selection of community function to work. So with this kind of theoretical uh, framework, we want to ask the future direction is to ask how numbers of communities or the total population size in newborn, the mutation rate, and the selection strength, right? All these factors would actually affect one of these um, three, um, three aspects. How would these changes in these various experimental parameters affect the rate of improvement of community function? So with that, I want to thank the organizers for putting together this wonderful symposium. And I uh, welcome your questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Chris. Okay. Well, that was fantastic, both in terms of content and in terms of style. Um, it seems, so, so the, the second one on your list, the total population size of the newborn, I'm going to put a vote there. Uh, it, it, have, you, have you played around with that at all? Because it seems like you've got this inherent um, conflict if you've got uh, you know, producers with different fraction going to product. That's Those right. that make more product will be, that's a good group trait, but it's a bad individual trait because they grow more slowly. And so, you know, if you dilute much smaller, and it's okay if occasionally some of your populations even go extinct because they don't have, you know, that's one of the right, two, right. but then you could purify those that have a high production of product and have no, you know, low product. Oh, it's actually right? more, um, I see your point, but it's more complex than but, that. Because yeah. if you manufacture grow, you have more producers, even though each producer is producing less. That's why for the monoculture, it's also like intermediate FP. See what I'm saying? Because a single cell just can't do, even if you spend all your effort making product, it's not as correct. It won't, it as exponential growth of manufacture, and each of them yeah. spent less in making product. It, sorry, maybe I wasn't quite entirely clear. It, it won't monotonically select for higher and higher, because obviously it can't go to 0.99 or whatever. Right. But it, you should, in very few cycles, be able, whatever that intermediate optimum is, 0.5 or whatever the, the optimum is, I think you could really quickly 
purify for, for that number, whatever number best suits oh, the otherwise in parameters. In monoculture selection? No, we, with group level selection, but going to smaller bottlenecks. Smaller bottlenecks, you mean mono, I mean M selection or M, group, group of M? Group level selection, oh, but M. bottleneck much more strongly, so that whatever intermediate level of FP is optimal for this group selective trait, I think you could get there rather so quickly. More quickly than that. Yeah. yeah that's exactly, that's, you have exactly, the same, exactly the right idea, right? Because I didn't have time to cover group level selection, right? Because the, the, the newborn size is critical for the, the rate of evolution, right? The rate of improvement. That's why we want to try total population size in newborn. That's the second item. You're exactly right. That's right. One question here. I'm not sure if this uh, model is, can be generalized for any product because, you know, like if the product is um, obtained by a chromosomal gene or a blasmid gene because the blasmids are not stable, but chromosomes are stable, so. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Because that's a no mutant I'm talking about, right? You can lose plasmid, right? So the rate, the, the mutation, we're actually trying, you know, um, yeah, trying different mutation rate spectrum. Right, so if it's a plasmid loss, it's a much higher non-mutant. So actually, we have tried that. It actually does affect this quite dramatically in the sense that whether you can purify away those non-producers from the community. That's a very good point. Yeah. We have a question here. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the slide when you yes. uh, showed P versus T plot? Uh, go back. Yeah. So uh, this is something interesting, uh, the second and the third one. It's like of, uh, it, it shows uh, some cutoff and, uh, in time, and after that it booms, right? So uh, That's the time we harvest the communities and do selection. That's okay. like arbitrary determined As experimenters, you have to choose the time at which you will do right, the, the, the selection. Right? So this is the, 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 the longer, sorry, I should have marked so the, the longer maturation time. You extend by 20%, that's about 20% extension of maturation time, such that the, um, the unlucky communities, the average communities would catch up with the, um, I didn't explain that well, uh, most likely. Right? So, so this is average, this is average community. I should have shown one maybe it's of a less lucky community, right? They would grow even less. So then you would have, even if these communities have identical average FP, they would actually reach very different levels. And when you harvest them, if you harvest them at this point, they will look very different. And you might pick this one, right? even if this FP is smaller than the other one. So that's what happened earlier. Right? So you pick this one, even though this has very low, like a lot of non-producers, but just because it happened to have more cells, it gets picked. And more cells is not heritable, because the next round you may not have more cells. So um, if we extend the maturation time just by bit, by little bit, right? so all communities, regardless of the stochastic fluctuation at the beginning, right, they will all, um, in the end, reach the same point if they have the same FP. So then if you have higher FP, you end up higher, you get selected. So that's why once we extend the maturation time T, we're not considering the physiological changes associated with stationary phase, right? Then, then um, this becomes, this really helps a community uh, function selection. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. So, so with this.